Olfactory receptors are our chemical sensing receptors, and they're also called G-coupled protein receptors. Now, they were first discovered in the nose. So, for example, the 2004 Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine was awarded to Richard Axel and Linda Buck for their discovery of these smell receptors, as well as the organization of the olfactory system. But since then, we have also found that olfactory receptors are not just present in the nose, hence this other name of G-coupled protein receptors. There are several essential physiological and pathophysiological processes that have been described as being targeted by the human olfactory receptors, including things like cells pathfinding, cell growth, cell death, the migration and secretion as well meaning that cells themselves can sniff out a path or sniff out the cells that they would like to destroy. Some very specific examples include uh, heart muscle cells, um, where the olfactory receptors on them can be a metabol meta metabolic regulator of heart function. And in the immune system, they can promote the death of certain types of cells and have been used, for example, in specifically targeting leukemia. In the liver, they can reduce the spread of liver cancer cells. And in the skin, it can increase the regeneration of skin cells and help speed up wound healing. So manipulating olfactory receptors is also a very um, interesting path for research in the future um, that helps to control other biological processes as well, such as digestion, skin regeneration, and hair growth. We have around 40 million neurons in the olfactory epithelium, and they get replaced every four to eight weeks. These neurons are embedded in the mucus inside the nasal cavity, which you can see in the image on the left-hand side there. And the odor chemicals get stuck in the mucus and trigger the neurons to fire in response. The signal is then passed through the olfactory bulb, which you can see there in yellow, and then passed into the limbic parts of the brain, which is the image on the right-hand side. There are around 400 different types of specialized sensor proteins known as olfactory receptors in our noses. And one odor molecule can activate several different olfactory receptors. And any given receptor can be activated by several different types of odor molecules. And this flexibility allows us to de detect around 1 trillion different kinds of smells. There are two main cranial nerves responsible for detecting odors in the environment. The olfactory nerve, um, also the olfactory bulb there you can see pointed to on the bottom, and the trigeminal nerve, which you can see uh, in the right-hand side photo. The olfactory nerve is actually in direct contact with the olfactory neurons found in your olfactory epithelium, which means that it is the only cranial nerve that is in direct contact with the sort of outside world, the outside of your body. Whereas the trigeminal nerve is located sort of throughout the face, and it's called trigeminal, meaning three, as there are three distinct branches. Smells like vanilla are known to only trigger the olfactory nerve, um, but most smells will trigger both the trigeminal and the olfactory nerve to some degree. So there will be some, some level of trigger for the olfactory nerve and some level of trigger for the trigeminal nerve. And if you feel any kind of burning or tingling, tickling or stinging, that's your trigeminal nerve. So for example, the smell of menthol would be a good example that, of a scent that triggers the trigeminal nerve fairly heavily. And another example of a smell, well, I call it a smell, um, that only triggers the trigeminal nerve is CO2. So for example, dry ice gives off CO2, so carbon dioxide. And if you lean over dry ice and smell it, you can't actually smell anything, but it feels like burning. So smelling is our ability to detect airborne volatile chemicals, and it's really akin to an alarm system. It alerts us to important things in the environment. If your ability to smell begins to decline, it can affect your everyday safety, which means you potentially can't smell food when it has spoiled, um, or if there's smoke or gas in the environment. 
there's also a large impact on diet and nutrition. So for example, when smell starts to decline, food choices will often suffer because people will tend to pick less nutritious choices such as junk food because junk food tends to trigger our main taste receptors and our taste receptors are only sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami. Um, often individuals might even add sugar or salt to boost the flavors and this can lead to um, a lower quality diet, which then also leads to other medical conditions such as high blood pressure, kidney disease, or diabetes. Smell is also very important for well being and relationships. Odors can influence many aspects of our lives, such as memory, mood, and emotions. And additionally, humans detect the scent of hormones and can even sniff out the genetic complexity of a potential mate. And the purpose of this is finding a partner who will produce very genetically diverse offspring. So these molecules that we smell on other humans also tend to support our sustained intimacy and relationships. So smell is highly influential in forming and maintaining close personal bonds. And all of this tends to be operating more in the background compared to many of our other senses. And this means that smell is often a very important, but also overlooked part of everyone's lives. So in addition to these, smell is also used to detect some of the very earliest signs of neurodegenerative diseases. So those with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease often tend to have limited or no sense of smell at all. And smell is one of the very first things to decline in these neurodegenerative diseases before even memory, before motor, and before cognitive abilities. Impairment in smell precedes the onset of motor symptoms in Parkinson's and precedes cognitive symptoms in dementia by about 5 to 15 years. Smell tests are also very inexpensive. So one one-time use smell test costs around $20. Um, Medical doctors can purchase a reusable test that can be used on numerous people for around about a, a year before it needs to be refilled. And the cost for that is just over $1,000. This makes them very relatively affordable for the healthcare system. Now, because a low sense of smell comes so early in the disease progression, it gives ample time to pursue more expensive biomarker screening, to implement lifestyle changes, or even to join interventions. And clinical trials. So this research is fo specifically focused on things that we've done here at UVic and in our 2018 paper variability and coupling of olfactory identification and episodic memory in older adults we looked at how olfactory scores and episodic memory scores fluctuated together over time. We found that on any occasion that an individual had taken both a smell test and a memory test if one of their scores was either above or below their own personal average, the other score would be as well, meaning that those things were coupled together and they would travel together over these measurement occasions. So that on days when they performed worse on memory, they also performed worse on smell. And interestingly, this association was much stronger in people who also had Alzheimer's disease pathology at death. And you can see an illustration of this in the image here depicted on the right hand side. In our second study, which is currently under review at Neurology Clinical Practice, and there may also be some people here from Tico's presentation yesterday. Um, thank you for being here. I believe she mentioned briefly this um, paper. Our objective was to determine the extent to which olfactory ability predicts transitions between clinically diagnosed cognitive states and death. And you can see here in the image on the bottom. We also wanted to look at the degree to which olfaction impacts cognitively unimpaired and total life expectancies in middle to older, older aged adults. In this study, we had around 1500 participants from the Rush Memory and Aging Project, which is in the US. And one of the most interesting aspects of this study was the statistical model that we used. It's called a multi-state survival model, and it's able to estimate the impact of baseline olfaction on transition patterns through cognitive states. And these would be clinically diagnosed by um, a psychologist, um, unimpaired, 
mild cognitive impairment, and dementia. And we could look at those as well as death simultaneously, meaning that after accounting for all of these cognitive states and death included in the model, olfactory abilities still predicted the transitions to mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease, but not death as we previously thought. And this ability to account for the competing risks allows us to really surmise that although the underlying neuropathology impacts both cognition and olfactory ability, olfaction doesn't predict death over and above cognitive impairments. So with some further investigation, we could potentially begin to tease apart some of the timelines for these clinical markers of olfaction and cognition and build up um, a way to have very, very early diagnostic markers that are easy to implement into a large population. Now, higher baseline olfactory test scores were associated with a lower risk of transitioning from unimpaired to mild cognitive impairment and from mild cognitive impairment to dementia. And additionally, if individuals had higher scores, it was associated with a greater likelihood of going back from mild and cognitive impairment to unimpaired cognitive functioning. So it had a bit of a protective factor there. Now, high baseline olfactory test scores were also associated with having up to six additional years of life free of cognitive impairment, kind of called health span, so very healthy years, so six additional healthy years, and in addition to that, five more years of overall lifespan. So for this study, we found higher olfactory ability is associated with a decreased risk of progressing forwards through cognitive states, and associations between olfaction and death, mortality, are likely to occur primarily through the pathway of neurodegeneration. And together, these analyses highlight how important it is, um, the type of methodology, and accounting for occasion-specific cognition, especially when investigating the link between olfaction and mortality. To summarize some of our main contributions to health, Olfaction and memory will fluctuate together over measurement occasions, meaning that performance is associated in a meaningful and measurable way between both cognition and olfaction. Higher olfactory scores decrease the risk of cognitive impairment and dementia and increase the likelihood of returning to unimpaired. Olfactory declines are apparent very early on in neurodegenerative diseases, often 10 to 20 years before clinically diagnosable dementia, and this means they can be used for early risk assessment. Olfactory changes can also assist with detection of neurodevelopmental disorders, things like autism and ADHD, and those are very, very highly um, linked to developmental stages and need to be timed accurately um, in the developmental stage. So young children can be, um, you can be using olfactory change to detect autism and ADHD, but you can't use it in older adults. So there are developmental um, timings with diagnosis as well. So what does this really mean? Um, ideally, olfactory testing should be part of regular health testing. We generally will get our eyes checked, we get our hearing checked. This is another sense that should be checked annually and regularly within the medical system. One test doesn't necessarily mean very much. It should be tracked over time. Um, one test can be impacted by, you know, if you slept really badly that night, um, or if you have a cold, any of those kinds of things will be um, alleviated if you're tracking the sense over a period of time. Repeated tests in childhood could also help for detection of neurodevelopmental disorders. And olfactory tests are much easy to administer to children compared to cognitive tests. And repeated testing in adulthood can give clear indications to impending issues such as neurodegenerative um, pathology. So it is a great indicator of brain health. And just before we close here, the biggest question I have for my future research is would smell training impact cognition? So in previous research, we already know that smell training, so training your sense of smell by practicing smelling items, improves 
your sense of smell, regardless of the reason for the olfactory loss. So it doesn't matter if it was a head injury or if there's underlying neuropathology, um, but regardless of the reason, if there's practice involved and training, the sense of smell will improve. Now, since olfaction and cognition are so closely linked and they fluctuate together over these measurement occasions, it seems highly likely to me that training a sense of smell might also improve cognition. And if this is true, this opens the door for a lot of uh, interesting training and intervention opportunities that could assist with dementia.